Welcome to our, uh, our Descriptors of Energy Landscapes Using Topological Data Analysis webinar. And today I'm very excited to be able to have uh, uh, Dr. Julian Tierney, who is going to be providing an introduction to the Topology Toolkit, TTK software. Uh, Julian is currently a research scientist at CNRS um, uh, and is associated with uh, Sorbonne University. Uh, prior to that, he spent some time in the U.S. as a Fulbright postdoc at the University of Utah with Valerio Pescucci. Uh, and he's been working at CNRS for about a decade now, developing TTK and other topological data analysis tools. Uh, I know a, a large number of people in the community are really interested in using TTK, and so I think this is an excellent resource, and we're really grateful that he's going to be able to provide some examples and, 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 and help the broader community use TTK um, uh, and teach us how to use TTK. So with that, uh, Julian, please take it away. Thank you so much for being here. All right. Well, hi, everyone, and uh, thanks for watching this talk, and, and thanks to the organizers who invited me. This is a, a real pleasure for me. So um, I am the uh, founder and lead developer of uh, TTK for Topology Toolkit, and today I'm going to, to give you this uh, general tour of what the, the toolkit is all about. So uh, before getting to the, the details of TTK, I will first uh, give you a quick overview of our research in order to, to give some context about uh, why we even developed TTK in the first place. So we are a uh, small research group uh, composed of myself, an engineer, and currently a uh, four students at Sorbonne University. So Sorbonne University is located in downtown Paris, uh, right here along the river, and Notre Dame is right here on this island. And um, our research uh, focuses on topological methods for data analysis and visualization, and uh, in particular in an interactive context where users uh, need to explore uh, their data sets to, to get insights. And we also have a, a focus on applications in uh, sciences and engineering. So our work is mainly concerned with the computational aspects of uh, topological methods. We, we are part of the computer science, computer science department and we're working towards the development of algorithms that are efficient in practice and we are also interested in, in processing what I call emerging types of, uh, of data and I'll come back to that after. So all of, our, all of the research that we do is meant uh, to be concretely implemented in actual software packages to to validate our approaches uh, with real life data sets. So overall TTK um, is our research development platform and we implement all of our algorithms as uh, modules for, for TTK. All right. So to give you a, a little bit more context, uh, the main uh, venues where we publish our work are data visualization and analysis venues such as uh, IEEE Viz, which is the, the main uh, forum in this topic. And this is a picture that, that I took last year uh, at Viz in Vancouver. Right, so uh, about TTK, um, originally uh, we've been using it internally for since uh, 2015. And um, the idea was to have a software platform that would help our students to, uh, to uh, streamline their implementations. So the project started in 2015 and two years after it reached a uh, critical size in terms of a uh, number of features, such that we thought that it had the potential to, to interest others, uh, both as users and developers. So uh, we decided to release it open source in 2017 uh, with a permissive license, a uh, BSD license. And um, so to the, um, TTK is developed in C++. Uh, this is kind of the standard a choice for advanced systems uh, where speed is a critical component, and this is the case for us. And um, as of today, there's uh, 15 institutions who uh, which contributed to, to TTK, uh, mostly in academia, but also a few companies which are experimenting with it for uh, their research and development. So TTK is specialized for uh, low dimensional continuous data, and it, it has uh, fast algorithms to analyze that kind of data set. So if you, if you are dealing with continuous data, which is defined on some uh, low dimensional domain, uh, typically 2D or 3D, uh, like you have here an, an image or a terrain, for instance, uh, you should definitely uh, consider TTK to analyze it. There's a few aspects where TTK uh, currently shines uh, a little less, of course, uh, um, such as the support for vector and tensor data. So currently what happens for uh, vector and tensor data, people try to identify a scalar descriptor that is well suited for their problem, and then they run the topological analysis uh, based on this descriptor. 
Uh, for instance, for vector data, you can take the magnitude or the magnitude of the curl or other things depending on your application. Another aspect where uh, TTK is not necessarily uh, a good fit is high dimensional data. And for such data sets, uh, we provide a few dimensionality uh, reduction features uh, that can be used to project the data down to uh, lower dimensions where the, the toolkit is uh, currently able to operate. All right, so we have a lot of uh, resources available on uh, TTK's website, and uh, you have the address of the website right here. Uh, we have uh, detailed installation instructions plus videos on how to install it. We also provide a, a data package uh, with uh, examples, and I'll talk about that later. And we have many uh, video tutorials, as well as exercises and, uh, and all that. Uh, we have also a user mailing list, which is uh, rather uh, responsive. So usually, um, if you send an email there, you, you can expect an answer within the next two days or so. All right. So at the moment, uh, if you want to install TTK, the recommended version a way is to install, uh, install, install it from, from source. And we have detailed instructions on how to do that. If you just want to give it a try uh, without installing it on your system, uh, we provide uh, virtualization solutions uh, based on VirtualBox and Docker. And um, if you want to install TTK to use it just with Python, uh, we have an Anaconda package. Uh, and here, obviously, this is very easy to, uh, to put together. And last, we're currently working uh, on a significant uh, revamp of the API with many new features. And hopefully, we'll have the next release of TTK uh, before the fall. But if you want to play already with the latest features that we have in store, uh, you can give it a try at the development version of the, of the code, which is uh, on GitHub. OK. So now, how uh, should you interact with TTK? So for end users, uh, the default way I would recommend is via uh, the plugins that we provide for uh, Paraview. And I further uh, describe uh, Paraview um, in the next slide. But in short, this is an open source uh, data visualization and analysis system, which is a, uh, a de facto standard in scientific computing. So if you are already familiar with Paraview, we definitely recommend to use TTK with Paraview. And we also provide a light uh, Python API that is well suited for fast scripting. And I'll, I'll demo that in two minutes. So there are also uh, plugins for another visualization system, which is called InVivo, but uh, these are supported by the InVivo team. Now, if you're a developer um, uh, and if you want to use TTK from your own code, we provide uh, several APIs. Uh, in particular, we interface with uh, VTK, which is uh, the visualization toolkit. So this is the uh, recommended uh, way to interact with TTK as a developer. And again, if you're familiar with VTK, that should be very easy because our API here is fully VTK compliant. So this, is, um, this looks like some ordinary VTK code. So this is available in C++ and Python. And uh, the two APIs, C++ and Python, are, are nearly identical. And last, uh, if you are an advanced developer and if you want to use TTK uh, within a pre-existing complex system for which you do not want to, to pull the VTK dependencies, we also provide a plain C++ API that relies on no external dependency. Uh, and for this, um, well, this is the, probably by far the less convenient API, of course, uh, but this is the, the price to pay for this level of independence. So now I'll give you a, a quick tour of Paraview uh, such that you get an idea of what is doable with that interface. So for our research, uh, there's a number of features uh, which are definitely interesting in Paraview. Uh, the first one being uh, the, the IOS report, which is very uh, rich. So basically, if you have some data set in whatever form, it's very likely that Paraview already knows how to open it and uh, you can start to analyze it uh, right off the bat. Um, Paraview also comes with modern uh, rendering backends uh, for the actual rendering of the visualization, which are based on the latest uh, versions of OpenGL, but also the, the recasting engines uh, from Intel and NVIDIA. And there's also a, a very rich um, user interface uh, that is great for visual debugging that we use quite a lot. So then uh, Paraview, uh, just like VTK, um, follows a sort of pipeline philosophy. And uh, the pipeline in this example is this tiny uh, window that you see here. And uh, this means that all the features are available as a sort of uh, data processing block, uh, which is called a filter. And the 
filters can be uh, put together into a pipeline. And uh, in this example, the, the pipeline is very simple. You just have the data, we compute some critical points and we have some spheres, but it can get uh, fairly uh, complicated uh, depending on how you, you put the different uh, filters together. And here are, of course, the TTK features are accessible as filters um, for these pipelines and they can be easily combined with the features that are already available in Power BI by default. So from a user perspective, this is often called visual programming because you just assemble the different classes, the different filters together uh, just with the user interface and you don't have to produce code. And here, an important aspect of the pipeline um, philosophy is that if you want to change at any time a parameter in your pipeline, you just need to change it uh, in the filter uh, where you have the parameter defined and it will automatically propagate to the rest of the pipeline so you don't have to reconstruct everything. And uh, last cool thing um, that the um, uh, part of you is doing is that the little program that you put together uh, with those filters, you can actually export as a Python script. So really in the end, you just put those filters together uh, in the user interface and you can uh, extract that as a Python script. And I'll try to uh, demo that uh, really quick. So here, I'll just open part view. So I hope that you guys will be able to, to see my screen. I will load a uh, example data set that is right there. So here you have the pipeline view. Here you have the main view. Uh, this is just a terrain uh, surface uh, mesh. And here I'll plot it with um, some um, data that is attached to it. So if you want to access some feature features, you go to uh, uh, the filters menu where you have all the um, uh, analysis features available and all the TTK ones that are at the bottom. And here I'll just compute uh, the critical points uh, which are right here. I'll click on apply. So uh, now I will just uh, look at this into the spreadsheet view and here you have a list of critical points. So this is just the list of singularities and I will explain later what this is. But basically you have those points with some meta uh, data that you can save as a C CSV file, for instance, if you want to uh, process it later. And uh, back in the 3D view, uh, you can put some spheres on top of that uh, to uh, visualize those uh, critical points. This is how it looked like. And we can color them by uh, index. And here you have local maximum at the top of the hills, local minima here and saddles everywhere else. So you can save uh, your pipeline as a uh, state file and then you can reopen it later. But really what you save is just the composition of the filters together. But what is uh, really cool as well is that you can save this as a Python script directly. So here you do save state and uh, you select the Python here, state file. I'll call it test. Okay, okay. And then I will uh, close part view. All right. And I will edit this file. So this is a script that is generated automatically, so it's very verbose, but we can remove a lot of it. Actually, you want to remove all the beginning up to the section that actually does some data processing, uh, which is right here, so that we remove. And all the bottom we can remove as well. So the spheres, for instance, we don't really care in the batch mode. And here really what the script is doing is that it's just loading some data and then computing some critical points. And then you can uh, save that into uh, some CSV file if you want. And what we want is uh, this object. Okay. And then you just called your script. And it will run uh, the analysis pipeline that you designed. Then we can look at the critical points.csv file. And here again, you have the list of singularities that you can, in the CSV file, that you can process with whatever tool you want afterwards. Okay. So, so Julian, quick question. Sure. So the input file was uh, just raw XYZ data or was it processed somehow? Uh, I'll come back to that after. Okay. Uh, th this one was a uh, uh, simple shell complex already with a scalar okay. uh, data set on it. Thanks. No worries. So overall, in terms of user experience, you can access TTK with ParView. And, and here you have a screenshot with the pipeline that is slightly more uh, complicated with a persistence diagram, Morseman complex, and a persistence curve. Uh, we also provide standalone programs that you can use to reproduce exactly the same things. And also, uh, 
in batch mode. So basically the output is stored to disk. And now if you want to reproduce the exact same pipeline, well, you can do it with the features that I just demoed before. And uh, reproducing this only takes 20 lines of Python. And if you want to do this uh, with the VTK C++ API, it's a little more because it's a little more verbose. And if you want to do it in plain, plain C++ with no other dependency, then uh, it's a little more verbose as well because you have to do a lot of uh, groundwork that the VTK API is doing for you. All right, so all of the ex these examples are available in the source code in the example directory, and we provide the same pipeline for all the APIs that we uh, uh, support. So you can play with those um, if you want from, as a starting point, for instance. Okay, so we also provide a data package with uh, concrete examples of analysis, and here I'll invite you to, to visit the tutorial section of our website as well. Uh, but basically, you can take any one of these demos and reproduce them very easily. And with the pipeline, you can infer what we did and how we put the different components together. And you can also export, the, export them as a Python script. And you can include that uh, in a Python project later on if you want. So here, for instance, uh, I will show an example. So yeah, I'll take my terminal here. Okay. So to run one of the uh, examples, you need to go to the data uh, package. You just call PowerView and you select uh, the example that you want. And here I'll, I'll take the tribute uh, demo um, that will uh, pop up in a second. So I'm recording this from my laptop. So with um, zoom going on in the background. This is a little slower than uh, usual, but here uh, you get to, to see it uh, in a second. So this demo uh, is actually a demo that we reproduced uh, from the textbook on computational topology from Adels, Brunner and Harrer. Uh, it's something like page 200 and so. And uh, what it does actually is that it's uh, running an analysis of um, some microscopy image to isolate the different cells in the image. And here, this is a very standard pipeline where you have some persistence uh, based uh, feature selection and then some more semi complex computation. And this basically you can infer what we did as a process uh, by looking at the pipeline. You can even play with the parameters. So here uh, we selected only the most persistent uh, maxima of the signal, where you can change that, for instance, if you uh, allow uh, maxima that are less persistent, so let's say four, uh, the pipeline will be updated automatically. And here in this case, you, you will have more maxima and you will have a sort of a uh, over uh, segmentation that will uh, appear as well. Yeah, this is how it looks. But then again, you can export that in Python and you can um, use that later if you want. Okay, so we've been running a few uh, tutorials in TTK, uh, in particular at, at this in Berlin and Vancouver over the last two years, and all the material is available on the, on the website here with slides uh, showing step-by-step -step instructions on how to use the software and data examples and pre-installed virtual machines. So this is also a, a good entry point if you want to give it a try at, at TTK. All right, so now I will move on with the tour uh, of the different features that are uh, supported. So to be as generic as possible, we, we consider that the input data is always represented some way or another by a piecewise linear scalar field uh, that is defined on some triangulation, M here or right there. And on the right, you have a, a standard uh, example of a volumetric model of a hand where the scalar values um, are simply the elevation and this is the color map that you see from uh, blue to, to green. So uh, the triangulation is a simple shell complex. Uh, in this example, it's vertices, edges, triangles, and tetrahedra. And um, the interest of the simple shell complex representation is that this is fairly generic. And uh, any mesh can be turned into a simple shell complex by splitting its cells into simplices. In Parview, you can do that with a filter that is called tetrahedralize. And also regular grids, which are very popular in scientific computing, can be handled uh, with those uh, complexes. So 
to for this, for, for instance, these are the standard pixel images that you get out of a camera or the voxel images that you get uh, out of a CT scan, for instance. And here uh, for regular grids uh, in TTK, these are implicitly triangulated. So we actually emulate at runtime the subdivision of the cells into simplices to be uh, efficient in terms of memory. And we also support uh, periodic grids, uh, which are um, useful to, to model crystal structures, for instance, in material sciences. So if your input is not a continuous domain, but point cloud, for instance, um, then you want to create a scalar function that represents uh, the point cloud well. And here, part of you comes with features to, to compute density estimates, for instance. All right. So now I'll move on to uh, the features which are available for scalar data. I will assume that you are familiar uh, with the concepts uh, that our algorithms uh, implement, but if you need some clarification at any point in the presentation, please feel free to, to interrupt. So the first feature uh, that we have is the extraction, extraction of critical points. This is useful, for instance, in fluid dynamics if you want to extract uh, vortices. And here we implemented the standard uh, combinatorial algorithm uh, for PL scalar fields that is based on the uh, enumeration of the connected components of lower and upper links uh, for each vertex. So this is very, uh, very efficient algorithm with linear time complexity. And this is also trivially uh, parallelizable. And the output is really um, the point cloud representing the critical points uh, with various meta information uh, on it, such as the um, vertex identifier where the singularity occurred, such that you can go back to your data to see where it is. And also it's indexed to disambiguate minima, maxima, and saddles. And here the, the maxima are uh, in green, saddles in white, and mini mind blue. So this is uh, the toy example that I will use for the next few slides. Um, and here uh, to Clark, to go back to the question that uh, was asked before, uh, this is a um, just a pixel image uh, with a floating point value, and then um, I just represented it as a terrain in, in 2D, in a terrain in 3D. So it's a 2D surface in 3D. All right, so this module extract the singularities of your data. And obviously, if you have a little bit of noise on your data, you will have lots of singularities that pop up. And uh, then you'll need to, to be able to disambiguate uh, noise from features. And that is precisely uh, one of the motivations for topological persistence, which can be uh, visualized um, with the persistence diagram. And in TTK, we have fast algorithms that are specialized for uh, low dimensional data. In particular, uh, to extract the pairs uh, that involve uh, extremum and saddles, we compute the diagram by uh, reading it from the merge tree. Uh, discuss about, uh, introduce that later, uh, for which we have a fast parallel algorithm that we published uh, last year in a in reference journal in parallel algorithms. For um, saddle saddle pairs, so those corresponds to um, uh, genus changes in the isosurfaces. Uh, these are computed uh, by reversing saddle saddle connectors and uh, say more about that when I, I touch discrete morph theory in a, in a few, down in a few slides. So as you would expect from a persistence diagram, if you include some additive noise uh, to your data, you have new pairs that uh, show up and they stand out uh, from the diagonal. And here you have a stronger noise and a stronger noise here. So then you can uh, filter the different pairs that you have in your persistence diagram based on their persistence to just uh, select only the, the features which are the, the, most persist the, the more persistent. And since for each point here, we have the information of the vertex where um, the, the maximum occurred in the data, we can actually visualize those features back in, uh, in the original domain. So you can select the features of interest in the diagram and view them uh, back in 3D. And this is how we can see that you still have three uh, prominent hills on this uh, noisy landscape. All right, we also uh, provide the persistence curve um, uh, representation that is just a curve that plots uh, the number of pairs more persistent than a continuously increasing threshold. And in practice, this is useful to, to select, uh, let's say, good uh, persistence threshold uh, with which you want to uh, filter your data. So usually you have discontinuities in those curves that exhibit a sort of transition from noise to features, and you want to only look at the features that are uh, more persistent than uh, this threshold. So in practice, you play a little bit with this curve to adjust uh, the simplification. 
So once we can uh, identify the most important uh, critical points in the data, uh, comes the uh, following question. Uh, is it possible to reconstruct a simplified version of the data that only contains the features that we selected in the diagram? So that problem, we uh, refer uh, to it as uh, the problem of topological data simplification. And there's a TTK module for that. And as a matter of fact, uh, this is the uh, default mechanism in TTK for multi-scale analysis. So really, if you want to analyze uh, topological features on multiple scales, the recommended strategy is always to select the critical points to preserve, call this simplification module, and then proceed with the rest of the analysis. So if you want to compute a simplified rib graph, for instance, you must first simplify the data and then compute the rib graph of the simplified data. So this is done with this module that implements uh, that paper uh, that we published a few years back uh, that uh, simplify data based on extremum uh, removal. And the simple description of this algorithm is that it somehow flattens uh, the data to remove the critical points uh, that you don't want in a way that guarantees that no uh, further, no extra critical points are introduced at a combinatorial level to, to ensure the overall consistency of the, of the framework. So, um, basically, if you were to, to remove uh, that maximum here, this is how your data would look like after the simplification. And if you want to remove that maximum, this is how your data would look like. So every time you want to simplify things in TTK, this is basically what you do to your data. So once we know how to simplify data, we can actually introduce compression techniques uh, that compress the data in a way that guarantees uh, the preservation of the persistence diagram up to a certain uh, persistence threshold. So in short, the user specifies a uh, persistent threshold above which uh, the features should be preserved by the compressor. And then the compression of the data is guaranteed to maintain uh, the persistence diagram for these features. So the higher is that epsilon threshold, the fewer persistent pairs you will preserve and the more you will compress. And on the contrary, the lower is the epsilon threshold, the more persistence pairs you will preserve and the less you, you will compress. So this is how we control control the, the level of compression. So um, we found this algorithm to be quite useful in practice because it allows you to, to compress your data and at the same time be sure that uh, the topological analysis that you went after is kind of faithful to, to the original data. So here at the top you have uh, the original uh, data set and um, here you have the compressed version with this algorithm for a small version of epsilon. And if you increase that epsilon, you start to have visual artifacts that occur and uh, you can go all the way to the extreme point where you only preserve uh, the three most persistent maxima. And you have those sort of uh, Dirac uh, peak where the, uh, the local maximum is um, standing on top of the plateaus. And here, uh, the diagram for this pair is uh, preserved, but obviously the geometry of the data is gone. So we can um, uh, extend this approach with uh, pointwise um, error bound uh, enforcement. And you can also uh, combine it with a ZFP, which is a very popular uh, compressor in scientific computing. So in the end, you compress your data and at the same time you have the guarantee uh, that its persistence diagram is epsilon away uh, from the original one. All right, so now uh, we, can, we know how to simplify the data, we can compute uh, things on it. And the first object that we'll consider here is the merge tree, which is a tree that tracks the connectivity evolution of the sub-level sets of the data, or the super-level sets, if it's one way or the other. And in this example, you have three maxima, and as you decrease uh, the isovalues values from plus infinity to minus infinity, the number of connected components of the super-level sets uh, changes. So you have one new component per uh, local maximum, and when you reach a set, all those components merge together, and this is exactly what this tree uh, tracks. So each point uh, on, on an arc here represent connected components and two points in the same subtree represent nested components. So in a sense, this is uh, slightly more informative than the persistence diagram because you have a sense of who uh, merged with who. And uh, you see how these structures uh, connect to each other. So one of the uh, key things with merged trees and contra trees is that these algorithms that compute them maintain a map uh, that goes from the domain to the tree. So for each arc, you know exactly which region of the domain corresponds to. And um, this is basically what you see here, this uh, slight blue arc correspond to this region in blue. And this feature is very useful in practice for data segmentation. 
so if you know that the features that you want to extract are um, more or less aligned with level sets, but you struggle to find a proper ISO value that captures all of the features, uh, maybe the merge tree is the, is the tool that you need to, to do this. And I'll demo that in a second. So this tree uh, shows a certain stability to noise. Uh, so if you have some noise in your data, you can simplify it uh, as I showed before and then compute the merge tree. And uh, this is exactly what you get here. And um, yes, you can also produce uh, counter trees with this module, which track the connectivity evolution of the level sets for simply connected domains. So merge tree based segmentation is uh, a classical uh, method uh, for volumetric data. And this is what you see here with the example of a CT scan of a foot. So the input data is a voxel grid and in each voxel you have the response uh, to the scan. And here I computed the persistence diagram of a voxel grid and I selected only the five most persistent features. And I asked uh, the simplification module uh, to only keep those in the data. So to simplify the data and only keep those. And then I computed the merge tree that you see here. And then for each of the arcs that are connected to local maxima, I extracted the corresponding region in the domain. And with this simple uh, procedure right off the bat, you have this uh, data segmentation uh, where you have each of the toes uh, of the foot. And what is interesting in this example is that if you increase further uh, the number of features that you want, if you go from five to 10, for instance, uh, well, what you're gonna have is that those uh, segments will be exactly sp split uh, right along the joints here. So this is one of the nice features of um, merge tree based segmentations because you have this sort of multi-scale uh, data segmentation. And, and here the real valued function is something like density? Uh, this is actually uh, the response of the scan. So it's a function of density of the material. So it's okay. a denser for the bone. Uh, right. It's uh, less dense for uh, the tissues. And of course it's close to zero for the uh, outside environment. Thanks. Um, so when the domain is not simply connected, uh, when it contains handles, uh, the more general notion of rip graph is needed to track the connectivity of level sets. And you have an example here with a harmonic function uh, computed on this uh, surface. And that generates a rib graph, in this case, that has as many loops as the geometry, uh, as the geometry domain has handles. So for this, uh, TTK implements an algorithm that we published last year, uh, which is an efficient parallelization of an algorithm uh, by Sel and Parsa, which has uh, optimal time complexity. And from a user's perspective, uh, this module behaves exactly the same as the one for merge trees. All right, so now uh, comes uh, an important feature in TTK, which is the uh, Morseman complex. So this complex is just a cell complex uh, representation of data, such that any two points in the domain which integrate forward and backward to the same extremities end up in the same cell. So for instance, if you take a point here and you integrate forward, you will uh, walk towards this local maximum. And if you integrate downward from the initial point, you will go back to this minimum. And then if you take a neighbor and if you have the same extremities, those two guys will belong to the same cell uh, that you see here in, the, in, in blue. So like most modern implementations of the Morseman complex, uh, TTK's implementation is based on discrete Morse theory. And this comes with a number of, uh, of nice things, um, including the robustness and the ease of implementation. So there's a number of things that are difficult to handle in the PL setting that magically uh, vanish in the discrete Morse theory. So this is really nice when you uh, implement that. And um, so once you have uh, what is called a discrete gradient, um, you can compute the Morse math complex fairly easily with the standard algorithm based on a deep path collection. And uh, the computation of this, the discrete gradient itself, though, um, for that, there's many alternatives. So we published a few years back an algorithm uh, to compute what we call the PL compliant discrete gradient. Uh, this was based on a previous algorithm by Shiva Shankar and Natarajan. An algorithm plus processed the gradient to make sure that each uh, remaining critical cell contained uh, a critical point according to the PL setting, such that there was uh, a mapping between the two. And this was important because we, we, had, we had to have the Morseman complex to be compliant with the rest of the algorithms that we implemented in TTK. And last year I had the chance to, to meet uh, Vanessa Robbins and we had a, a just a discussion about her algorithm based on uh, homotopic expansion, uh, which could achieve a similar result. In the end, uh, we uh, experimented with both. And the two algorithms have their own drawbacks and uh, advantages, but 
the um, omotopic expansion uh, seems to, to behave uh, better for noisy data sets. And uh, this is the, the default implementation that is uh, currently on the, on the dev branch. So the output of this module is a list of critical points, uh, the one-dimensional separatrices, uh, the two-dimensional two separatrices uh, in 3D, and also the segmentation of the data into the cells of the Mars Magnum Plex. And again, as shown before, if you have some noise, you can simplify and then compute uh, the Mars Magnum Complex on the simplified data. So here, the Mars Magnum Complex, though, is known to be not very stable under small perturbation. So not only the geometry of the separatrices can change, but also they can reconnect in a very uh, drastically different configurations. All right, so an application where um, the Mars Magnum Complex is, um, is particularly useful is um, quantum chemistry, where experts model uh, molecular interactions at the atom level uh, by simulating, for instance, uh, what is called the electron density. And here, um, I understand that there's experts of the field on, on the call today, so maybe I don't need to, to go into too many details. Um, but basically, here in this data set, you have a 3D regular grid, and for each that, um, vertex, you have um, what is called the electron density. Uh, and uh, basically, if you take an ISO surface of this uh, density, you can see the two molecules that are here that interact with each other. So if you compute the Morse Mac complex, uh, you'll, and if you look at the one-dimensional separatrices, this is what you get. And uh, what is nice here is that you have the saddle extremum separatrices uh, in blue um, that uh, connect atoms together. So the atoms here are in blue. So you have the covalent uh, interactions that are captured here, but also what is more interesting for uh, the experts are uh, what they call the non-covalent interactions. So uh, those are hydrogen bonds here and there. And uh, with, with those separatrices, you can extract them and then do further computation of them to, to understand the distribution of electron density along those bonds, for instance, and, um, and other things. You can also have a look at the uh, two-dimensional uh, separatrices um, of, the, of the domain that separates the flow uh, based on their, um, their gradient integration. So the idea here is that if you integrate from a point backward, uh, you will never cross those uh, surfaces. And here, those surfaces form the, the boundary of the basins uh, of the atoms. And as far as I understand, uh, those can be used to integrate density to, to evaluate the energy of the system. All right, so now that we have several features uh, also to- May I just ask a question at this point? Sure. Yes, um, in this quantum chemical model, um, so it appears that uh, in the surface defined by the uh, electron density, you can have sometimes critical points which are degenerate, uh, meaning that the Hessian is not invertible and that leading to catastrophes. And it seems that that is of chemical relevance. Can you detect with TTK um, those degenerate critical points? Uh, yes and no. So do, do we have time to answer that question now or it, because the answer can be uh, arbitrarily long here. Yeah. <laughs> Why don't you go for it a little, a little bit? Give us a... Okay. So actually, at the computational aspect, uh, as a computer scientist, we want to go away from those degenerate configurations because they're harder to handle. And um, in the standard uh, piecewise linear setting, actually just isolating those degenerate saddles is fairly easy. This is no more uh, complicated than identifying critical points, but to construct a valid uh, Morseman complex out of that is very difficult. So mm -hmm. this is why we use discrete Morse theory, which has a number of nice advantages, including that of implicitly unfolding uh, degenerate saddles into simple ones. So mm -hmm. what will, it's, and it's really by construction, there's nothing to do here. It's just theoretical um, model that is like that. It's, as long as you have a manifold uh, domain, you have the guarantee that the saddle cannot be degenerate. The saddles cannot be degenerate. So, um, with this model, they will be harder to identify, but we can identify those with the PL setting, mm -hmm. the, the degenerate saddles. 
but then having the precise connections might be difficult. So what you will have with this algorithm is that you will have many simple saddles that will look very close to each other and you will have an arbitrary arrangement between those in, in their vicinity. But the mm -hmm. global picture uh, will look fairly similar, I would say. Okay, okay thank you. Uh, okay, so, so now I will uh, move on to uh, uh, the few features that we have in TTK to, uh, to deal with collections of uh, data sets, particularly if you want to uh, represent collection of data sets uh, by topological signatures, um, you need a distance metric to compare them. And here TTK implements uh, established uh, metrics for persistence diagrams, including the uh, bottleneck distance and the Wasserstein distance. And here we have both exact computations uh, based on variants of the Moncrest algorithm and fast approximations based on a uh, progressive variant of the auction approach. So in practice, um, this is um, computed very efficiently. So those distances are established by optimizing an assignment problem between the points of the two diagrams. And this is exactly what you can visualize here. You have those two diagrams and, and the bars here actually show uh, the optimal assignment that was computed to, to get this metric. And each persistence diagram here corresponds to um, a simulation run of a uh, hurricane uh, simulation. Okay, so once you have a metric uh, that is available, you can compute more advanced things such as bar centers of persistence diagrams. And this is uh, useful to visualize a diagram that summarizes uh, a collection of data sets. And also once you have an algorithm to compute bar centers, it's not very difficult to extend it to implement k-means clusterings um, based on the on these bar centers. And this is pretty much what we have implemented in TDK. And what you can see uh, in this example, uh, you have a collection of runs of a hurricane simulation. Uh, we compute a diagram for each of those, and then uh, we run our clustering algorithms uh, based on the diagrams. And uh, the diagram that you see here is actually the bar center that we computed, which is the um, centroid of the cluster. And uh, for that, we implemented an algorithm that we published last year at Viz, uh, which is a fast and progressive version of the um, algorithm by uh, Kate Turner and, and colleagues. And I'd be happy to, to provide more details about that later, but I will probably uh, uh, accelerate a little bit. Uh, so based on these assignment solvers, you can also use the strategies to um, implement a few algorithms to track features over time. And this is what you see here uh, with this uh, 2D flow example uh, where the um, time is given by the vertical uh, component and the vertices in the flow are tracked with these trajectories which are computed by solving optimal assignments between, um, between uh, consecutive time steps. So here you have the time step at the beginning, uh, here towards the middle and here uh, towards the end. Right. So now I would say a few words if I have time uh, about some algorithms for emerging data types. Um, I don't know where I'm standing with the time right now. I feel it's been 40 minutes already. It's, um, I have 48 minutes past the hour. All right, so I will probably uh, skip those, but in short, we have algorithms for uh, read spaces and Jacobi sets, uh, if you're interested in those, and also algorithms for uncertain data. Uh, I would just, say a few words about what we do for uh, high dimensional data. So the default thing is to uh, project it to lower dimensions. And uh, here we connect to scikit-learn uh, to leverage their uh, dimensionality reduction algorithms. And you have a, a few of those. So you can read uh, some um, data as a CSV file and then project it in 2D for instance. And once you have done that, um, what you need to use TTK is to describe this point cloud with a scalar field that somehow describe it well. And you can do this, for instance, uh, with density estimates based on uh, Gaussian kernels. And at this point, you have a scalar field and you can do everything that I explained before. And in particular, you can do what is called persistence-based clustering, which is a, a very uh, natural ID, which is essentially the same thing as uh, the example that I demoed uh, at the beginning uh, with the example from the textbook from uh, Edos Brennan and Hauer. But basically you have this um, density, you can simplify by persistence, compute the most complex of this, and then project uh, the points back in the basins of the most complex to do the clustering. And this is the color that you see on the points. And here, what I'm showing is the actual ground truth of this data set. So originally it's a data set in 64 dimensions uh, with a known ground truth for the classification. 
So you have a few outliers here with points with a different colors from the others. But overall, the, um, the classification that we provide is, uh, is fairly good, although everything happens in 2D. Um, you can also similarly um, use the reap graph to cluster the data based on something that mimics the mapper. And this can be achieved by putting um, a few TTK modules together. So here you have your input data, uh, the density estimates. And then I took a uh, super level set of this density estimate to have a representation of, a, of the domain. And then I chose an arbitrary function to represent this data set, which is just the uh, elevation here. And I computed the reap graph. And then I used the segmentation and projected back the points uh, from the input of the segmentation to, to get their clustering. All right. Uh, there's many more features. Um, I will not necessarily have time to uh, explain them all, uh, but please have a look at the tutorial uh, section of the website. Uh, there's a few uh, applications where we've been using uh, these tools recently, uh, including uh, an application in quantum chemistry to evaluate uh, the strength of non-covalent interactions, um, also in uh, fluid dynamics, and also in uh, material sciences. And I'd be happy to describe that later. So to conclude, uh, first I'd like to take this opportunity to invite you all to, to join our user and developer communities. Uh, we have active uh, mailing lists, uh, many tutorials and examples. It's easy to interface your code with TTK. And uh, for, for developers, uh, TTK provides a research platform that eases uh, the development of topological methods. And actually this is why we implemented it in the first place to, to, to uh, to ease our development. It's very easy to create a new module and to get it started and running in a, in a couple of minutes. So please don't hesitate to get, get in touch with us. Uh, everybody can help and everybody's welcome. And uh, so in the next few months, we'll continue the work that we're currently doing to simplify the installation procedure, uh, which at the moment uh, may uh, discourage uh, some users. So we'll try to, to facilitate that with binary distributions and we're currently working uh, with Kitware to include TTK in the uh, official distribution of Carview and, and we, we have a demo of that hopefully uh, by the end of the year and then it's gonna be a process of, uh, uh, of discussing with um, uh, technical leaders of Carview to see if this is doable. Um, and at the algorithm level, there's also several extensions that we'd like to explore um, particular uh, vector and tensor data and uh, high dimensional data as well. And with this, uh, well, I think I can uh, thank you for your attention and uh, I'd like to thank all the contributors to the TTK community and I'll be uh, very happy to take questions. Excellent, well, let's thank Julian. That was really wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Are there questions for Julian today? Uh, so, uh, is it uh, easy to add these uh, filters, the TTK filters in Paraview? I mean, so you mentioned that you know it's going to be natively available in Paraview maybe by the end of this year or something. But how, we're, how we're working towards that. Yes. Okay. And how is it done now? So now, uh, basically. Uh, we have installation procedures. Um, what we recommend is to build Parview from, from source and to build TTK. And then we have uh, detailed instructions on how to proceed, but uh, Parview is well, well designed that regard. You can develop external plugins and it's fairly easy to, to uh, integrate them. So if you're familiar with uh, the CMake infrastructure, it's just a matter of running CMake and then running your usual compiling tool and then installing the thing. So, so you, it is part of the uh, Paraview installation itself, you're saying. You, you have to change the CMake for the Paraview. So this is what we recommend. Uh, but what you can also do is to take the binary version of Paraview uh, from Kitware's website mm -hmm. and then build uh, TTK against it. But you have to, to make sure that there's an um, uh, API version match here. So you cannot build any version of, of TTK against any version of Paraview. You have to make sure that these are the same. And this is why we, we prefer to recommend to, to build the two together such that we can guarantee that users are, are using the compatible versions. I mean, I'm asking that question because, you know, <clears throat> so we use high performance computing systems and some of these tools are installed by the staff. 
at the, at the systems and I mean, we want to, you know, I mean, we probably have optimized certain things in that process and we want to actually exploit all those optimizations. Uh, so it will be nice if you can actually add these as a plugin or, you know, on the binary if possible. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, there, there, are, there, are, there are two possibilities, right? One is as a user, I should be able to add my own filters instead of just, you know, broadly adding it for the whole thing because everybody may not want to have all these filters. Mm -hmm. Something like but um, actually, uh, technically, you can already install PowerView and TTK uh, in your home directory if you have something similar on the, on your system. If you have, as soon as you have enough uh, disk space, you can install it locally and run it locally, and that doesn't uh, require um, uh, admin privileges. As soon as you do the installation in, in your own uh, disk space. I had a question, Julian. So you mentioned uh, Jacoby, Jacoby fields. Uh, could you say a little bit more? Sets. Jacoby sets. Could you say a little bit about those? Oh, thank you very much. Then I, I will be able to talk about those. <laughs> um, uh, let me go back to, to the slides uh, a second. So this is a concept that I believe dates back um, dates a few years. I mean, at least the first algorithm that I know of uh, has been published in the early uh, 2000s. So I will explain the concept with a tiny example. Here you have a volume with which you have a bivariate uh, scalar field defined on it. And here, this is a very simple example. You have uh, X coordinates and Y coordinates. So mm -hmm. this volume is projected here in the range space. And if you take a point in the range, the pre image will be a curve, right? This is the curve that you see in color. And now if you take uh, an axis line line in the range, this corresponds to an isosurface in the volume of one of the two functions. Mm -hmm. And now if you consider the other function on, on that surface, this is the gradient of color that you see, you can compute critical points on that surface. This is local maximum here, here, a saddle here, and a minimum here. And then if you sweep from uh, left to right uh, the domain and you make that curve move and the isosurface move as well, basically those critical points will follow a trajectory which is the Jacobi set. Huh. So this is really the analog of uh, critical points for uh, multivariate data. Cool. And actually, we use those to compute the reef space um, because the, the reef space somehow can be viewed as a sort of continuous stacking of reef graphs. And this is a very similar kind of construction. And here at the bottom, we have a very simple reef graph. And you need to ima imagine that those reef graphs are just continually stacked to each other to form uh, two-dimensional cells in this case. Ah, very nice. Thank you. Yeah. I had, so I had, oh, go ahead, Aurora. Well, I just had a quick question about dimensionality and kind of the maximum dimensionality that you could um, use TTK for. Obviously, reduction needs to happen of high dimensional data, but like how reduced is really optimal? Uh, it's hard to answer that. Uh, I can tell you uh, how, how much high we can go. Uh, so basically in the current version of TTK, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, we're specialized for low dimensional uh, data. And um, we heavily rely on, uh, on the data that is given to us by uh, PowerView at the moment. And that supports only uh, uh, 2D and 3D uh, data and 1D data. So you cannot go higher than 3D uh, at the moment. As, as soon as you want to go higher than 3D, uh, basically uh, the uh, sample shell complexes data structures that are given to us by VTK uh, cannot express uh, higher dimensional simplices. So gotcha. we, we're kind of bounded for the moment, but this is something we're working on. And then in the context of data size, um, mm -hmm. like in the terms of, um, so, so oftentimes, I'm sure you saw this also in the quantum chemistry data, but perhaps less so, you know, like what's the, what is a, a reasonable data set size that you can ingest in the context of like um, grid or mesh points or something like this? So if you're dealing uh, with a laptop, for instance, like the one I have, you can, it, it's hard to go beyond a 256 cube uh, with a workstation, you can go uh, uh, above 512 cube and up to a 1024 cube. And above that, uh, it really depends on how much memory you have. Uh, and also, 
uh, you run into issues of um, uh, identifiers representation. Uh, this is very technical, but basically there, there's some switches that you need to trigger in TTK to handle uh, long identifiers for very large data sets. And that tends to, to make the, the algorithms run a little slower. But personally, I've been experimenting with data sets up in the range of, a, of a 1K cube, I would say. Awesome, thank you. On a workstation, I have, on a workstation. I have one more question. On the slide you just have up, you have the singularities extraction. So in which sense do you mean singularities and is there a module and what are the methods? I mean, it's probably, again, a huge topic, <laughs> uh, we, but just uh, maybe some so, remarks. On yeah, this. I, I didn't give much detail about this uh, slide and I apologize for that. Here, uh, really, the idea of this module here is to analyze uh, what we call bivariate data. So when you map a, a simple shell complex to uh, a Euclidean space, which doesn't have dimension one anymore. So in this case, we have, are specialized for dimension two. And um, in the dimension one in standard more theory, basically uh, singularities are the critical points where uh, the sublevel set change uh, their topology. And here in 2D, you have a direct analogy in the sense that if you take the pre-image uh, of a point, so this is the, the curve that you see in, a, in, green, in a yellow here, if you move that point in the domain, it will change, uh, the, the pre-image will change their topology in very specific configurations. So for instance, if you take that yellow point and you make it move further down this line that you see in white, those two connected components will connect again and will have the topology of the curve that you see in blue at the bottom. So those, those are called Jacobi sets. And that's kind of the extension of the notion of critical point to, to bivariate data. And, the, and in short, this, these are the locations where the fibers uh, connect and disconnect. Any um, other remaining questions for Julian? I, I have one more related to singularities. So if you have, um, I mean, singularities in the sense of algebraic varieties, um, can you detect those? I mean, this might go a little bit away, but. Um, yeah, what I meant by singularities is really singularities in the sub-level set or in the structures yeah. that you extract out of the data. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. But I guess there has to be some connection um, uh, I can say anything obvious at the moment, though. Okay, thanks. Wonderful. Well, with that, um, I just want to thank you again, Julian. This was really great. We really appreciate it. And